Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is one of the most aggressive malignant tumors of the brain. It's the most common primary cancer of the brain. It develops inside the brain. It doesn't come from anywhere else. About 18,000 cases each year in the United States. It's thought that about half of these occur in people over age 70, associated with a dismal prognosis. That's compounded by the inability of the brain to heal itself. Now we have primary tumors of the brain, glioblastoma is the most common, and then we have metastatic tumors to the brain. Metastatic tumors come from somewhere else, half of the time from the lung, the other half from the breast or melanoma or colon or kidney or even from the throat. Inside the brain there are a couple different kinds of cells. Obviously there are the nerve cells, the brain cells, and then we have the supporting cells. We call those the glial cells. That's the glue of the central nervous system. What it does is it makes the myelin and it makes the brain function normally. Now there are different kinds of glial cells. There are astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. The tumor we're talking about, the glioblastoma, is thought to come from some stem cells or maybe from the astrocytes. About two-thirds of the glioblastoma happen to occur in the cerebral cortex. Most of them in the frontal lobe or the temporal lobe, sometime in the parietal or occipital lobe, but they can occur anywhere in the brain. Could occur in the brain stem or the cerebellum or the spinal cord. Rarely it's the result of some sort of a genetic syndrome, sometime from some ionizing radiation. For instance, you had brain irradiation for acute lymphoblastic leukemia as a kid. Head trauma probably doesn't have much to do with it. The idea about your cell phone causing brain cancer, nope, tobacco, nope, pesticides, formaldehyde, vinyl chloride, none of those things seem to make any difference. Now, 15% of all primary brain tumors are this glioblastoma or glioblastoma multiforme or grade 4 glioblastoma. 13 to 15,000 deaths, 18,000 new cases occur more frequently in men than women, Caucasians than others. It seems to be age-related. About 65 is the median age group, means half of the cases occur before age 65, half of the cases after age 65, but can even occur in teenagers. And as a matter of fact, glioblastoma is the third most frequent cause of cancer-related deaths in individuals between the ages of about 15 and 35, the average survival with full bore therapy is 14 months. That means 50% of the people live shorter period of time, 50% of the people live longer. Unfortunately, without therapy, most people die within several months. The overall two-year survival is only about 2 or 3%, but we still have some 10-year survivors. Once the disease recurs, then the average survival is only about six to eight months. The glioma, those tumors, don't always have to be malignant. You could have a grade one glioma, and that's okay. You're probably not going to die from that. Then you could have a grade two or grade three. And the grade four are the glioblastoma multiforme, the malignancies. Those are the ones we're talking about. Unfortunately, the symptoms are really nonspecific. They might be a headache, traditionally worse in the morning, seems to get better during the day. About a quarter of the people present with seizures. Half of the people have seizures during the course of the disease. There's some nausea or vomiting. Personality changes about half of the people, especially if it's in the frontal lobe. Some cognitive memory changes. Neurologic changes in about half of the people. Altered vision, difficulty walking with your gait. Difficulty with the speech, difficulty with sensation, muscles can become weak, it can become incontinent, you can have a poor short-term memory, depression, and sometimes there's loss of executive function. That means you can't manage your time, you can't multitask, you can't pay attention, you can't switch focus from one thing to another. Symptoms tend to vary depending where in the brain the tumor happens to be and how big it is. For instance, in the temporal lobe you might have some hearing and some vision problems, and in the frontal lobe you might have some personality changes cause of the problem might be the mass effect of the tumor, something growing inside your brain, taking up space. You already have a full load with the brain and the cerebral spinal fluid, and now once you start having a tumor, that can put pressure on and distort the nerves. 
Well, additionally, there's a lot of edema, a lot of swelling that occurs around the tumor. That makes matters even worse. Usually, from the time the tumor begins to develop until the time it's diagnosed, relatively short period, less than three to six months. But if the tumor develops from those low-grade gliomas, remember grade one or more likely grade two, grade three, then we can talk about several year from the duration, several years from the time the tumor begins until it's diagnosed. Unfortunately, it can be so rapid with the glioblastoma that it's mistaken for a stroke diagnosed typically with an MRI, a gadolinium enhanced MRI, makes the tumor light up. There's a necrotic area that can be seen. There's some hemorrhage around, some dilation of the blood vessels. Sometimes it's necessary to do a PET scan, sometimes a CAT scan. And when we talk about glioblastoma, glioblastoma tends to develop by itself. It just develops as a glioblastoma grade four, or the old glioblastoma multiforme. In those cases, that's the most frequent kind of a tumor. It's the most aggressive tumor. It's the one associated with the shortest survival. And unfortunately, it tends to occur in older people with poor prognosis. Now, we can develop from that grade two or grade three glioma, and it can then ultimately become a glioblastoma multiforme because of some mutations. Those tend to do somewhat better. They have a different genetic profile. Tends not to spread. Once the tumor develops, it stays basically right where it started. If we look under the microscope at the tumor cells, very bizarre looking cells, a lot of necrotic tissue. The margins are very ill-defined traditionally with a lot of blood vessels that are dilated. The mutations that we discover looking through the tumor tend to have something to do with the DNA repair. And there's some alterations in that DNA repair. Well, if we look at the primary tumor, the tumor that develops, as a glioblastoma, right from the start, we find that they have overexpression of the epidermal growth factor receptor, some loss of the C10Q, as opposed to the secondary tumors. Different genetic mutations completely. That was once upon a time thought that some of those genetic mutations might allow us to target them and treat the disease. So the epidermal growth factor receptor variant 3 mutation was thought, oh my goodness, this is 50% of the patients, and we can improve that. We can target that genetic abnormality. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out that way. Treatment, well, surgery, plus radiation, plus chemotherapy, plus plus tissue treating fields, and experimental therapy. The diagnosis frequently isn't even established until the surgical resection of the lesion. In 2005, some European investigators brought us up to the modern area where we current are, currently are, and that's in treating people less than age 65. They get surgery, then they get six weeks of radiation plus a medicine known as Temidar, that's taken orally. It's taken every day for about 42 to 49 days. And then afterward, then you start a series of chemotherapy with a higher dose of the Temidar. The Temidar is given five consecutive days every month for about six cycles. Surgical procedure could be just a biopsy or preferably complete excision of the entire lesion with clear margins. But Unfortunately, it's not usually clear. Or a partial resection. Unfortunately, because of the patient's age, because of some other medical problems, or because of where the tumor is, some people just can't have their tumor completely excised. Radiation, traditionally, is 30 days of radiation therapy, a total dose of 60 gray. It's thought, well, maybe give them more, give them 90 gray. Doesn't seem to do any better. The chemotherapy with Temidar adds a methyl group. So it adds a little blip on the DNA that supposedly will stop the cell from dividing. Well, unfortunately, those mutations that we talked about might not exist. And, and if they don't, then the cell can heal itself. If the cell takes that methyl group off, then it can keep on dividing. But there's another mutation that might develop. And if that mutation develops, then patients seem to do better with the Temidar. Temidar doesn't seem to have a whole lot of side effects, cause some nausea, vomiting, 
Sometimes it reduces the white blood cell count, reduces it so much that you can be prone to infection. Serious problem in about 4% of the people. It was approved in 2005 and it increased the survival of these malignancies, the glioblastoma, increased it from 12 months with the surgery to 14 and a half months with the surgery and the radiation therapy and the temidar. Now unfortunately, most people tend to relapse within about five to seven months after the discontinuation of the chemotherapy. It's found that additionally, maybe there's something called TTF, tumor treating field. It was approved originally in 2001 for 2011 for recurrent disease and 2015 it was approved additionally for after the radiation therapy now with the temidar it can be used so it's a low intensity electrical field that seems to alter the way the cells divide and seems to do that in a very favorable way so it increases the overall survival and increases the percentage of people who are alive at two years. You wear in effect a hat that's all these devices and they're connected to an electrical support, a battery pack. You wear it for at least 18 hours a day. But if the skin gets irritated, you can take it off for a while, put some cortisone cream on the skin, and then you begin the therapy again. You tend to wait till the radiation damage is over, and then concomitantly with the Temidar, it's used. Well, there's some other medicines that are available. None of the other medicines seem to have a dramatic effect. There's one called Avastin. You've heard about that. That's the one that's used to treat people who have macular degeneration. It's also used to treat a variety of cancers. Well, it stops the blood vessels from being produced. This is a disease that has a lot of blood vessels, so that's a good idea. And it improves the survival a smidgen. There are a variety of other medicines, including interferon and other therapies, don't seem to dramatically improve prognosis. People are now starting to use some of those checkpoint inhibitors to see if they might improve survival. Those are the medicines you hear advertised on the television like Optivo and Keytruda. They might have a role, we just don't know. Additionally, some people are experimenting with oncolytic viruses. We can arm certain kinds of viruses, even the herpes simplex virus, inject it in, it can seek out the malignant cell and then destroy it. Some people are experimenting with gene therapy and some people with certain kind of laser therapies. But overall, here we have a disease that has a terrible prognosis, especially in older people and especially when it crosses the midline, maybe somewhat better if it happens to begin in the cerebellum or if a person has a good performance score, a person's otherwise healthy. Recurrences, unfortunately, almost always occur, and they tend to occur within about an inch of where the primary tumor was. So even though you thought you cut it out completely, it tends to recur. It tends not to spread, not to be anywhere else other than locally. Well, we know that if it can't be completely eliminated surgically, then it always comes back. It always will regrow. Sometimes you need a second surgery, second surgery perhaps to treat a lesion or maybe to treat a complication of the lesion, follow up imaging with the MRI every two to three months afterward. Overall, with radiation therapy alone, the survival is about 12 months with radiation and the Temidar. As I say, we increase it to about 12, 14 and a half months. But unfortunately, the tumor tends to come back in those people, even though they survive. The progression-free survival with radiation therapy alone is only about five months, seven months with the radiation plus the Temidar. Worst prognosis in people who are elderly and people who are elderly, it seems that one, the medicines don't work as well and the overall survival continues to decrease. The elderly can't tolerate some of the therapies, can't tolerate the radiation, can't tolerate the chemotherapy because they're older, they have less immune properties, they have a problem with their 
bone marrow, it doesn't produce enough white cells anyway, decreased tolerance, decreased physical reserve, because they're taking a lot of other drugs, because of cognitive decline that already exists, and now we're compounding that with radiation therapy to the brain. So in some people, talk about palliative therapy, especially in the older age group. Stage 4 glioblastoma, remember primary brain cancer, unknown cause, especially poor prognosis in elderly individuals. The mean survival at the present time is only about 14, 14 and a half months, but in certain age groups we know that the tumor might be able to be conquered and we have some percentage of the people who seem to be long-term survivals. Relatively small number, but there's always a ray of hope. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.